I oftentimes get asked, how do you know when an ablation has been successful and how soon might you do a second or third ablation? Well, first off, if somebody's needing to do multiple ablations on you, that's telling me they're not doing a complex enough ablation for your stage of atrial fibrillation. But in general, you have to realize that when people do an ablation, and this is irregardless of the energy source, all right? It doesn't matter whether you're using radio frequency to cauterize the AFib cells, or you're using cryoablation to freeze the AFib cells, or you're using pulse filled ablation, the newest technology to create electromagnetic fields and pulses of electricity to denature or kill the cells without freezing or cauterizing it. In a sense, it doesn't really matter. When you do destroy these cells, first off, obviously, you have to see, is the doctor who's doing my procedure doing a complex enough ablation to actually get rid of all of my AFib cells? irregardless of the energy source. Because remember, putting out atrial fibrillation is not as simple as, oh, I have some AFib cells that are waking up, so they just go up there with their little catheters, wave a magic wand, and all the cells just magically die off, and either we get it all or we don't. It's not all or nothing, and it's not as simple as just waving a magic wand and having them all die off. No, it's more like a forest fire. The bigger the forest fire, the more walls you have these AFib cells on, the more complex a lesion set the person's doing the procedure needs to do to be able to get rid of your entire forest fire. And if you have, say, an 80% very progressed forest fire and somebody just gets rid of 20% of it, you could be left with 60%, in which case you're probably gonna need more procedures. But if they have the skill to get rid of all 80%, which not a lot of doctors have, then you may only need one procedure. So there is a wide variation between the success rates in ablation because it's not one size fits all, and it's not like everyone's at the same stage. It really is how big is your forest fire, and then what's the lesion set, or how complex the procedure is the doctor doing. So that's number one. And of course, skill is always more important than the energy source. But in terms of when we do destroy these cells, they don't die off right away. So the analogy I use for my patients is, I say, look, when I go in there, I'm gonna be targeting these abnormal AFib cells, and I'm going to be destroying them, regardless of whichever energy source the doctor is using. But when you destroy these cells, some of the cells die off right away from the energy source that's destroying them, and some of them are damaged, and they are dying, but they're not dead yet. And until they die, they could still wake up and send out abnormal electrical signals and cause an episode of atrial fibrillation. So it's not as simple as, oh, they did the procedure yesterday, and starting today, I'll have nothing. Or, oh, I had an episode of AFib a week later, so they failed. No, that's not true. These cells need time to die off. Now, how long will they take to die off? Well, some of these abnormal cells can take a day, a week, or even a month or two to die off. But in general, they won't die off any more past about three to four months. So there is this so-called three month blanking period, which every electrophysiologist talks about, which is in that first three months, you really can't say anything for sure. And therefore, if somebody has, a recurrence of atrial fibrillation within that first month or two, those cells might possibly be gone by month three. So you have to give it some time for these cells to die off. But past about three or four months, any AFib that wakes up past that point is something that survived the procedure. And so I would say that one of the ways you know whether or not you need another procedure is, are you having any more recurrence of atrial fibrillation past about three to four months? because it takes three or four months for all the cells to settle down and create scar, and then you'll know if there's anything remaining. So that's number one. Number two, when would you be a candidate for another ablation? Well, I wouldn't recommend it earlier than that three month blanking period, because if you're one month out and you're still having some AFib and somebody goes back in there and it's just cells dying off and creating scar, it's a little too soon. Everything's too fresh. You're not really sure what's real, what's not. You're not sure what's gonna die off or not. So I would say I would give it the three to four month period and then see if you have any AFib remaining and then consider another ablation if necessary. And then lastly, sometimes doctors don't do very complex ablations even if they're necessary because they either don't have the skill to or unfortunately they also make more money to, to not do that. So if they you have four walls out of the six filled with AFib cells and you're in it 70, 80% of the time and somebody goes in and does a simplistic one wall ablation, well, you're likely gonna have three walls worth of AFib left and still be going in and out of AFib even past the three month blanking period. Yes, it could be less, 
because ablation is not all or nothing, and it's more like turning the clock back to an earlier stage. So if they did get rid of some, it could be less, but it's likely going to still be a fair amount remaining if they didn't do very much. But then sometimes that's masked because they may put you or keep you on an antiarrhythmic medication, which are those drugs that keep the AFib asleep. Remember, when we treat atrial fibrillation, we can slow it down with rate controlling medications, medicines that don't suppress the AFib or keep you asleep. They just slow it down and try to make you tolerate it better or stronger antiarrhythmic drugs that actually work directly on the AFib cells to keep them asleep. They're just masking them. They're not getting rid of the AFib cells and they're not keeping you from getting older and forming more AFib cells, but they are masking them until your AFib gets strong enough to override those medicines or an ablation, which actually tries to turn the clock back and get rid of the cells. Those are the three main ways we have of treating it. Well, sometimes people get placed on an antiarrhythmic drug to suppress whatever the doctor didn't get rid of. Or sometimes they were on an antiarrhythmic drug and their AFib was getting so strong that it was breaking through. And then the doctor does a simplistic ablation, gets rid of a little bit, but not all of it. And then they keep them on that drug from that point forward to keep the rest asleep. So for example, I had a patient who was on the second strongest drug. It's called Ticacin or Dofetilide, they're the same drug. And this drug is a very powerful drug. It's the second strongest drug we have to keep AFib asleep. So it can probably suppress like four out of the six walls worth of AFib, meaning up until you have AFib on four out of the six walls, waking up 70 to 80% of the time, it's probably gonna keep your AFib mostly asleep. Now, this patient, probably got started when he had three walls worth of AFib. He was in it 50% of the time. They put him on the Ticacin and he was keeping everything asleep. But then let's say his AFib progressed as he got older and now it was at four and a half walls. And without the drug, he'd probably be in AFib 80% of the time. But on the drug, the drug was still partly working and it was still keeping some of the AFib asleep. So he was breaking through 20, 30% of the time, not 80% of the time. So he went to an electrophysiologist who did a simple one wall ablation, pulmonary vein isolation or PVI, the one wall. And that just wasn't enough. I mean, the patient had four and a half walls worth. He did one walls worth, but he did make it smaller. It's like making the forest fire smaller, turning it back to an earlier state. So he maybe, if you think about it in terms of walls worth of AFib, he maybe got him from four and a half walls to say three and a half walls, from 80% to maybe 60%. Now, had he stopped all drugs to keep the AFib asleep, the patient's AFib would have been still waking up 50, 60% of the time. But he kept him on that second strongest drug, the Ticacin, to keep the remainder of the AFib asleep. And it was more effective because if the drug can suppress 70% worth and he had 80% worth of AFib, so it was breaking through, but now after the ablation, he has maybe 60% worth of AFib, well, that drug can suppress 70% worth. So it was strong enough to keep his AFib completely asleep for about a year. But remember, if you turn the clock back with an ablation, whatever stage you turn it back to is the stage you're gonna form AFib cells from because AFib is a progressive problem. As you get older, you're always forming it. And so therefore, after about a year, this patient formed more AFib cells in other walls and he now was back at 80% or four and a half walls and he was breaking through the drug again. So he came to me for a second opinion and he was confused. He said, why did the AFib ablation only last 10 to 12 months? I thought it would last at least three to five years. And I said, well, the doctor didn't really get rid of all your atrial fibrillation. And the patient was actually really surprised. He said, what do you mean he didn't get rid of all my atrial fibrillation? I didn't have any atrial fibrillation for about a year. And I said, yes, but that's because he kept you on the second strongest drug we have to keep the remainder of your atrial fibrillation asleep. Had he truly gotten rid of all your AFib, he could have stopped the second strongest drug because there would have been no cells to keep asleep and you would have not gone into AFib at all. Or if he had gotten rid of 90%, maybe you would be waking up five or 10%, but he only got rid of a little bit and the remainder three and a half walls or 60% worth was being kept asleep by this super strong drug. So you have to understand that number one, it depends on whether you need another ablation it will depend on how much atrial fibrillation you're having after that three month blanking period. And it will depend on how much atrial fibrillation you're having off of any antiarrhythmic drugs to artificially keep your AFib asleep. That's what survived the ablation or that's what they didn't do or didn't get rid of enough. And that's what needs to be targeted. If they keep you on a drug and it's suppressing your AFib and you think you're not an AFib, well, that's not really true. Or if you're still breaking through a little bit, you might have a whole lot more. So how do you know when you need another ablation? If you're off an antiarrhythmic drug past the three month blanking period and you're still continuing to have significant amounts of atrial fibrillation, that's when 
you would be a candidate for another ablation. For everything atrial fibrillation related, please feel free to go to my website, drscottlee.com, where you're gonna find more resources and also can follow me on social media.